Hello, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, this session, Switching Teams, Moving an Application from MySQL to Postgres. Your speaker today is Julie Baumler. She uh, rotates between being a sysadmin who programs and a programmer who sysadmins. Uh, she's not a DBA, but has played one on TV. She has loved computers and programming since elementary school when her father took her and a copy of Creative Computing to the public library to use their single Commodore pet. And for the last two years, he has been working as a developer on the Cat Me Smarter project, a set of online behaviorally based tools for team formation and peer evaluation at the university level. So please welcome Julie. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so let's get started. Sorry about the computer crash. Of course, my computer would crash. Um, so SQL is a nicer standard, which means of course, it's a standard, right? We should just be able to switch. No problem. Not true. Uh, so this is close to the first computer I used a database on. Um, I'm just going to sort of go through my background really quickly so that because some of it applies as we talk about this, but it's not that important. Um, the first database I really worked on was um, based on AUK and ran a ticketing system. Um, in the 90s, started using Perl, Berkeley DB, a bunch of random proprietary databases, most of which I didn't even ever know their name except for the database on such and such computer because I was mostly the system administrator and all I really cared about was making sure they were backed up. Um, later in the, in the late 1990s, I used MySQL because we had to have something free and at that point Postgres didn't run 24-7. Um, early 2000s, I started using Oracle, DB2, and then was when I really started using databases was we were installing Remedy, which is a help desk system, and the DBAs didn't have any time, so I went to my boss. And I was like, hey, can I just install this? Can I run it? I think it'll help me be better at backing up the really important databases. Well, unfortunately, that became the really important database in the organization. <laughs> um, and then mid-2000s, I went back to MySQL, and then uh, company I was working for was bought out by Microsoft shop, so doing MS SQL, switched back to an open source shop, it's my SQL and Postgres, and then in 2011 I was hired on the Catme project. Um, the Catme app, on the other hand, was written originally in 2005, and uh, it was written on Mod Perl, which we still use, and MySQL, because you know, MySQL was what everyone used. Um, if they didn't have money to buy Oracle. Um, and then in 2008, Sun bought MySQL AB. And then in 2010, Oracle bought Sun. And the people on the project started getting worried about the future of MySQL because, as people here probably know, Oracle does not have a great history with open source. Um, and keep it, with keeping things as open as they were when they got them. Know, and not making changes that aren't complete turnarounds and, and things like that. So in 2012, we decided to do the conversion of the CatMe backend to Postgres, which is pretty much all we're going to talk about about my app at this point. Um, so other than being concerned about MySQL and what might happen, um, you know, we had to talk about what. I wanted to talk about why we didn't choose it because I honestly think that MySQL is still a good um, choice for an open source database in many cases. Um, you know, the, I think that the person who said this quote, MySQL does everything adequately right most of the time, meant it as sort of a put down of MySQL. But the fact that it's so simple to get something that does the right thing most of the time is great. Because sometimes that's all you need. Um, and it's really easy to find people who know how to code for MySQL, who know how to you know, get it running on your machine, keep it running on your machine. There's, there's not, well, you can certainly do magic with MySQL, but the basic 
you know, getting something done, not a lot of magic. It's not a bad, you know, let's just do something. Um, however, for us, it probably wasn't the optimal choice for us in 2005. Um, we write lots of subqueries, which is one of my people's weaknesses. We write lots of subqueries. The primary, pro the initial primary programmer, I am not the primary programmer, but the guy who's still on the project is the initial primary programmer, was really into Ingress and um, writes, you know, really, you know, multiple layers, subqueries, things that, that MySQL, every bit of code he writes is something that's added to MySQL later and sort of blobbed on maybe not as well as it could have been because it was not its core function. Um, I'm not much better. <laughs> so um, our needs in MySQL strings don't line up well. We don't need round robin replication, which is one of, in my mind, if you need that, which is pretty rare, but if you do, MySQL is the way to go. Um, I, I set it up. Um, we didn't actually end up using it in production because we it wasn't we didn't want to, but we thought we had to. Um, you know, but it does work, um, and that's a pretty amazing thing if you need it. Um, my understanding is Postgres people say, really, you think you need it, you don't. You're never going to get it. Um, at any rate, um, so the things that we considered was waiting to see what really happened with MySQL, which we decided not to do because we're grant funded and we had some time and money in our grant to make it possible to, to do that. Some things had changed since we initially wrote our grant and um, some of the things that we had money for were of less value or you know, we'd gotten money to do were of, had become of less value as the three-year grant had gone on. Um, so that was, um, in actually the first year of the grant, it sort of became a less valuable thing for people. Um, MariaDB, which is pretty much a, a drop-in replacement for MySQL, um, but then again, MySQL probably wasn't optimal for us before, and Postgres. Um, we didn't consider NoSQL because our application is very, very relational. Um, in fact, you would ask me to write this application in 2005 with, you know, all the money in the world. I might have done it with Oracle and the Oracle extensions and not mod per, for HTML and not mod Perl at all. Um, so, um, why did we choose Postgres? Um, we write SQL. Those of us on the dev team write SQL in a way that that Postgres handles very efficiently. So. That is a win-win. Um, and then uh, we had access to a bunch of good Postgres resources. And as I told my boss, we should do this while I'm still dating the Postgres expert. Um, <laughs> which, uh, was, uh, which, which was sort of, a, a, there was a lot of joking from that from my boss, but it actually turned out to be really handy that you know I had someone to go home to and go, so what the, you know, how do I do this? Or what's with that? Or I'm having trouble with this. And because I had not heavily used Postgres before doing this, mostly. My, my strongest experience was with Oracle and MySQL. Um, so the first thing we tried was, the first thing is I needed a schema to um, well, let me step back. We use Perl DBI, so changing Perl DBI to use Postgres from MySQL um, meant changing one word in one line. Um, we told it to use the Postgres DBI extension instead of the MySQL. What? DVD. DVD, thank you. Uh, and done. So then getting the schemas. We tried doing MySQL dump to change it to say that, oh, to SQL and then piping it into Postgres. Um, 
there's a Postgres mode in MySQL dump. I was all excited. Postgres hates it. Um, there's an ANSI mode. It's a lot better. I got, you know, meaningful error messages instead of just sort of, oh my god, I can't do this kind of error messages. Um, so from there, I started out and said, because as you can see, I just did, was doing a bunch of substitutions. Um, the main thing was that things were escaped wrong. Um, eventually I moved to awk, which this is the actual awk. And this code, by the way, is, um, I'm going to talk about code that I used for the rest of this, but not in depth because the code is on the wiki page for this presentation. And so, you know, it's probably much more interesting. I don't like reading code to people. It wasn't sort of meant to be read out loud. So, um, so there were a bunch of, of cheat fixes in how things had to be escaped, including at the bottom here, you can see there was, um, I finally just did a little hack around the, uh, something, some, some of the comments, some of the data had a slash at the end of the line, and so I had to save that. Um, and you can see, like, right here, um, we removed breaks because there was, we also ended up doing a lot of data cleanup. Um, there's, there was not any need to have, um, well, there were some places where we had data that we, we had HTML in our data where we needed it and some places where we didn't. So some of the fixing things was anytime anything, anytime data was bad and causing problems, I fixed it and got rid of it. Or I fixed it by getting rid of it. Um, so uh, other things that were difficult, not difficult, but really different um, were enums. Um, and so um, it, what, what an enum is, what is an enum in um, MySQL has to be that you can define when you're defining the table, it needs to be de defined um, as a type in Postgres. Um, so essentially I would just, and what happened is whenever I saw them, I just printed out the stuff to do that first because I was pulling, I was saving insert statements as I was going, so didn't type them out. Um, there was also increments and sequences are done differently. Um, and um, here I, I actually was creating, I actually created um, SQL commands to run after everything was done to reset them to their appropriate number. Um, and they're called something different, of course, because you know it's only a standard, we can't use the same names. Um, data types also um, were different and um, more, and some of them would work, but we're not Postgres native or SQL standard. Um, but also the other thing that we came into with data types is keeping them, um, is that, that Postgres is much pickier that your data types actually are what you say they are. Um, date handling is different. Um, and this is only part of the changes we made. Um, and, uh, the, I also, um, I just pulled updating timestamps out of, and put it in the code because we actually turned out, so not only is it different, and you have to install an extension to get um, auto update timestamps, but it turned out that sometimes we were updating timestamps just because they were auto updates and not because we actually wanted to update them. 
So it's like, woohoo, don't have to deal with that. Fix it in the code. Um, keys, we needed to create, switch to creating indexes for. Um, and there's some hacky stuff in here because that was just how it worked. And at some point, I don't really care as long as things work. Um, and then when I got to the end of a line, I was just, um, I would, once I, I knew I was done printing out all the, the changes that I had made and printed them out, um, and then the sequence lines that ran very last were um, where we recreated the things that had serials to set them to the correct value. Um, which was one of the things that, that actually really, um, the code worked great, and then it wouldn't <laughs> before I figured that one out. Okay. Um, so once I did that and could export my data and import it, things worked fairly well. And in fact, um, immediately our tests, as far as they would run, were running three times faster than they had run previously. It was a huge performance increase just without really having done anything. Um, but of course, a lot of the tests failed um, because we were using MySQLisms in our code. Um, most of them, this is actually a set script that I ran on most of my code. Um, that were the things that needed to change from in the code. Um, and that was probably 90% of the code changes was just you know simple enough that that simple substitution with said would fix it. Um, then then there were so this is all from the script I had with notes for the rest of the people on my team because um, as as I was doing this they were working on the new release. Um, so, so I had to be training them to write code for this. Um, so, um, how there's a lot of changes in handling dates, and that actually ended up being probably the biggest problem that we had because um, we had we we actually released with some date related bugs, and I spent. Well, so everything was fine because it was, we did it, our release between terms like we always do. And then the first term started. And um, all of a sudden, we started having weird errors that were not in our tests. Um, so uh, MySQL uses if. But that did not become a substitution because a lot of times you could actually use greatest or least instead, so they pretty much had to be done manually. Um, so that was why it just ended up as a note to my coworkers instead of the script. Um, and, oops. and then also we had, there was, with the if statements, there was, uh, Sometimes we wanted, um, we, we did a lot of comparing dates within, we do a lot of comparing dates within a range, and again, there are a couple different ways that can be done. So, more notes, which again, this code, you can download it if you want to do this or care. Or, um, back to the Postgres being more specific. Um, booleans had to be cast. We also had a lot of code that was the third line there where we um, do 
something or something where basically we would send data, we, we were deciding in the query if we actually had any data for a column, um, which did not work very well with Postgres at all. Um, it's also, well, using a database that makes heavy use of prepare, this makes sense because you can prepare your statement without knowing a lot about it. Postgres doesn't use prepare that heavily, so it was really inefficient for Postgres anyway. Um, the other change that I ran into a lot is that um, using as or parameter names when you're renaming them or subqueries is often optional in MySQL and was not in Postgres. Um, it's also a lot clearer either way Honestly, the code that had been written in ways that were clear, not tricky, and mostly complied with the standard, but at least clear, not tricky for when they needed something that was, you know, that was specific, that, that is not in the standard, but databases do, so much better than, <laughs> you know, worked so much easier than the things where people had done things that were tricky and, and interesting. Um, which actually, that's generally my experience with code in general. That you know, it's cool to do tricky stuff, but don't do it in production. Um, so, okay. Once we got through that, everything worked great. All our test data worked. Life was wonderful. Then we got into testing the actual production data, and um, that was horrible. Um, you really need to know your data. We did not know our data. We had a, a table that was entirely user generated. Well, that's actually something. Our project is specifically funded by the National Science Foundation for providing services to US universities. And um, none of the four, engin particularly engineering schools, none of the four engineering schools in Puerto Rico use our product. Uh, or have even expressed in interest, although we do have Spanish-speaking users, not any of the ones who would be covered by National Science Foundation. So we have no funds and no mandate and no ability to really spend money providing support for internationalization at all. Um, we're supposed to be providing services for English speakers. Our actual user base is all over the world. And we had a couple of tables that are freely generated comments from students to teachers. And we don't ever look at those. I'm the first one from the team to actually have looked at that data when it started breaking our conversion. <laughs> um, because that is our, you know, it's, those are confidential. Um, we try. And there's um, most of the people, we do research using the data that we gather, and this is not part of the data that we use for research. This is just something that we collected from students, we display it to their professors, done. So we have a bunch of people on our team in the US with English speaking students who use this. It all worked fine. <laughs> um, it's amazing how bad it was. <laughs> In, in other languages. Um, so, um, first we tried, to, tried using Charta. Unfortunately, Charta was not actually that accurate for the data we had, and um, we actually would have had to check every line. We would still, we did this conversion in December, we would still be running the conversion scripts if we were using Charta. Um, so then we figured out that there were two specific sets of data that were particularly problematic um, because our data was supposedly in UTF-8, but MySQL does not enforce that. Um, so we had TIS-620 data from students in Thailand mixed with English. 
Um, and CP949 character set data from Korea. So what we ended up doing is pulling out the data separately of all students of professors from Thai universities and all students of professors from Korean universities and running ICONV on those. Luckily, ICONV does fine if there's a lot of ASCII mixed in with it or we would have been in real trouble. Um, it was actually difficult to figure out that these were in Thai and Korean and those character sets initially because, of course, none of us speak those languages. Um, anyway, uh, then the next problem we ran into is, oh, I missed an S. Uh, character set Windows 1252, it's the Microsoft version of Latin 1. Um, so, uh, there are lots of characters that they use that, that are wrong. Um, the ones that always bother me is uh, there are a number of characters that are capitalized um, in the, the case is switched in, in Windows 1252 from actual standard Latin one. So I've worked with a lot of um, Portuguese and Eastern European customers at various jobs and you, it's very easy to end up capitalizing letters in the middle of their name. And I really, really dislike misspelling people that I work with's name, especially if I don't, if it is not really in my control, because it would depend on you know, the computer that I was using versus the one they were using, and that they had to both be set to the correct version, the same version of <laughs> Latin 1, uh, for, it, for it to work. Um, so that's why I think it's evil, actually, because anything that makes you misspell people's names is just, you know, that, that, that's sort of like the highest level of not caring about people, I think. Um, I mean, I have a hard enough time doing it not by mistake. So uh, with this stuff, for the rest of it, which was mostly fixing the fake Latin one, um, started said then I tried Oct, then Perl. Um, I ended up using C um, because, well, I learned as a sysadmin back when you wrote your tools in C. <laughs> that was the very end of that, actually. <laughs> um, you know, the old guys were making us use C and we were using Perl when we could get away with it. That was when I started sysadmining. Um, but, um, the, the interesting thing about C is that while it is not, in fact, true, it is basically, it is, not, it is not any part of any standard, but the reality is that for almost every version of Unix that you can find, the char data type is a byte. So if you just want to deal with bytes, it's very easy to do that. And I actually had a program that read in bytes and changed some of them that I'd written in like 1996 that I happened to find like three months before. <laughs> There's like a wait. <laughs> I can use that. Um, and so what I ended up doing was reading in bytes, determining whether or not they were actually UTF-8, um, and using the standard of UTF-8, which is up here. Um, and either printing them out as a wide character, wanting to get it to print out as a wide character, or just not. Or, or figuring out individually what they were probably going to be. For instance, OX92, which uh, should be, according to this chart, a continuing byte in a multi-byte sequence. So there should be a your first byte should be one of these. And then if it's one of these two, then your next byte will be one of these. Um, if you suddenly come across something in here, um, those were ASCII control characters. They're used that way in they. Um, however, the Windows version of Latin 1 uses them as characters that 
were not part of ASCII. Um, particularly um, back quotes, double back quotes, um, also the Enya, um, a couple others. So um, yeah, basically we did that. Um, we, we looked at them that way, which I could talk about probably for a whole other presentation, which is why a lot of this I'm just sort of skimming over. Um, because you know, we did this, it worked for us. The exact details are probably, either the tools that I have are going to be useful to you, or um, you probably have to figure it out yourself if you're doing a conversion. Um, I hope that these tools I wrote would be generally useful, but until someone else tries them, I don't know. Anyway, questions? Anyone? <laughs> and my contact information is here. That is the URL to the app if you want to look at it, um, which if you are a student or teacher, please do. Um, it's free. Um, but feel free to contact me beyond this if you have questions too. Uh, thank you for speaking. Um, I missed the beginning part. Could you talk a little bit about why you chose Postgres instead of sticking with uh, MySQL? Um, we were concerned about the history or about the future of MySQL, and Postgres was a better fit for us. Um, I, I don't want to go into a lot of detail because I've talked about that quite a bit, but. It's better for what we need the code to do. Did you miss anything once you had switched? Um, as far as, do you mean did we miss, like? Uh, were there features that you were like, well, oh, I wish we had that. It's worth switching overall. Um, so it's, I, no, you, I wish we had X. Actually, um, it, it has been almost entirely the other way. Um, because our performance has increased massively just by the efficiencies of Postgres over MySQL, which is not, I, I, that tends to be true in general, but it is particularly true for how we write code, which is, again, part of why we chose Postgres. Um, there are a couple things that I might miss in other, well, we chose, we, we made the decision to not just switch to Postgres, but to make the biggest possible effort to switch to standard, ANSI standard or ISO standard SQL as possible. Um, we'd already kind of done that, but, you know, Anytime we have the choice, as long as it is sufficiently performant, which so far it all has been, we are using standard SQL. So if in two years someone comes up with, well, you know, if in two years Oracle came to us and said, we will pay you to use Oracle, <laughs> we, will, we will pay for, you know, your development costs, you know, our grant's up in September, so we're looking for money. Um, <laughs> you know, if Oracle came to us and said, we'll pay you to use Oracle for our app and, and, and to come talk about how great it is on Oracle and, you know, we could do that at this point, give her, you know, plus or minus a few things where we had, there just isn't a standard and those would have to be changed, but we now kind of know what those are, you know, and they're marked. Um, so... We, we chose not to install any of the Postgres extensions. Um, that is, in other applications, I would miss that. That's not a choice I would want to make with many other applications. For this application, it works great. And so, since we could do everything we wanted to do just fine without any extensions, 
and you know it meets this other goal of following the standard as closely as possible. I'm happy with it. So someone asked me, I went over this work, this presentation two weeks ago, I think, for the Linux users group in Eugene for practice, and, and not even the whole presentation. But one of the questions that someone asked that I thought was a good question was, you have all this set in awk and C, you're writing Perl application, why didn't you use Perl? And um, that is, and, and you know, I thought that was a very reasonable question. but that's entirely because that's sort of how I learned to code. And the first database I worked on, we actually actually used a set of extensions to awk to access the database. So those are still um, you know, sort of my go-to places. I would have used Perl instead of C, except for, for the converting the, the unknown character set user data. But honestly, it's... Uh, it's kind of a pain in Perl to switch back and forth between wide characters and not. Um, which I think is a good thing because honestly, you should use wide characters for everything. Just bite the bullet if you're not now, start. But um, you, you will be happier in the long run I've spent. I've, I've made lots of money in my career fixing things because people did not use <laughs> wide characters from the start. And, and once you're using wide characters, pretty much any language is lovely. Well, thank you. You were a great audience. And feel free to contact me if you have any more questions or, like I said, the code is up. I will have the presentation up. <laughs>